than the assignments that we've had so far in that I want you to, de to design it first. And what, what do I mean by design? Um, you know, you can, you can substitute the words plan for design if you prefer. Think it through before you do it. Now, in an object-oriented world, design can mean many things. You know, design can be talking about what the user interface looks like. That's an aspect of design. Uh, design can, can be the, the database diagrams. That's part of the design. Well, we don't have any database, and we don't have any user interface, so it must not be that. What I'm going to go over today are the things that I want you to consider in your design. And so my plan for today is to um, introduce you, uh, or, or to review the, the object-oriented concepts relating to inheritance and then talk about uh, some of the design documents that you can create to produce your design and introduce you to the problem that I want you to solve. Um, I don't know how long that will take. They'll probably take most, if not all, of the period. Um, what I will, would like to do then is we'll see how it goes and we'll see what questions you have. Wednesday we will discuss it in one form or another. We might discuss it as a class, you might break into groups and discuss it. Um, but we'll, we'll see how it goes. We'll play it by ear. It's a little bit different than I've done assignments in the past, but I think it's, it's necessary. Um, no one, very few people like to design stuff. Most people would rather just open up and start coding. The problem is, is that while that can potentially be effective for small assignments, when you start getting into larger sort of projects, without a plan, without a design, you're going to be lost. Um, you need to get your thoughts down on paper. You need to, to plan what you're going to do. Otherwise, you're going to create a mess. Um, in addition, you need to communicate what you are going to do to other people. Um, with larger projects, you're likely not to be the only developer. So you need to make sure that the other developers on your team are, are on the same page. And as a result, it's important uh, to design. So let's review some object-oriented terms that relate to object-oriented design. This might be the first time I've used the word object-oriented. Um, we've been doing it the whole semester. We just have, have not been doing it um, in any sort of, of deep way. Now that when we get into inheritance, we're starting to talk about objects in, in a bit deeper way. All right. Inheritance is one of the relationships that um, two classes can have. What's a test to determine if one class inherits from another class? Is something, exactly, you know, the is a test. Can you say this is a that, uh, this is a type of that, all right? So in the example we went over before, we said a stuffed crust pizza is a pizza, all right? Therefore, it would be valid to inherit stuffed crust pizza from pizza. The other way around doesn't make a sense. A pizza is not a stuffed crust pizza. There can be pizzas that are not stuffed crust pizzas. All right? A automobile is a vehicle. So if you had a vehicle class, you could um, inherit automobile from it. Um, a motorcycle is a vehicle. A four-wheel drive is a vehicle, but it's also an automobile. So you could inherit four-wheel drive from automobile, which in turn inherits from vehicle. Um, so there's not just one level of inheritance. Um, sometimes you have things that are called uh, abstract classes. And we'll get a little bit more into it in, in the beginning, uh, or later on rather. But vehicle would be an example of an abstract class. In other words, how do, how do I put this? No one only drives a vehicle, right? People drive cars or motorcycles or four-wheel drives or trucks or scooters or bicycles or whatever, all right? Um, therefore, vehicle conceptually makes sense, 
But there's nothing that people actually use that is merely and only a vehicle. People will always use a specific instance of, uh, or, or a, a specific um, child of the vehicle class. So keep that in mind when you're designing classes. So the is a test is, is key in determining inheritance. And what does it mean when a class inherits from another class? What does it get? And what doesn't it get? It gets its attributes and methods, provided those attributes are declared as protected. So we're going to alter my statement earlier in the semester of saying that classes or attributes should be private. For the most part, attributes should be protected. And all protected means is that the superclass and the subclass can, can, use, those, um, can use those methods. All right, so it gets all the attributes and the methods. What do we then, what code do we put then? If it gets the attributes and methods from the superclass, what code do we put into the subclass? Exactly, the differences. So for example, there might be a new attribute in the subclass that wasn't in the superclass. And we saw that example when we said that um, a stuffed crust pizza has whatever the crust is stuffed with, the stuffing ingredient. All right? So it might have an attribute that um, the superclass doesn't have. It might have a method that the superclass doesn't have. For example, the set and get for the stuffing ingredient would be examples of methods that the super or subclass would have that would not be in the superclass. All right. Um, if we're looking at students versus graduate students, a graduate student is going to have the school that they graduated from, and therefore it might have method and it's going to have a degree that the that the student earned at at that at that college. So uh, a graduate student might have methods to find out what college that they graduated from and what year they graduated from and what their degree was. All right. So subclasses can have extra stuff that isn't in the subclass. I'm sorry, that is not in the superclass. The subclass can have stuff that is not in the superclass. What else can we do with subclasses? It also relates to differences between the subclass and the superclass. The methods, and what about the methods? Well, we can have new ones. We can have brand new methods that don't exist in the superclass. <laughs> that we can do. We can add extra methods. Use the existing ones, and what, what is it said that we do with the existing ones? Okay, so in other words, Think of the stuffed crust pizza, all right? We had, we had a calculate cost method in the stuffed crust pizza. There was a calculate cost method in the pizza class. Why did we have a method in the subclass when there was one in the superclass? Be because, because we need to, oh, the, the proper terminology is we override the method. There's a different way of calculating the cost for a stuffed crust pizza than there is for um, a regular pizza. And I think we might have done that with time as well. So, you get all the attributes and methods for free in the super class. But you can add methods, you can add attributes, and you can override methods. All right, so let's take a look at the example that we had last time a little more closely. Oh, there's one more thing. There's one little gotcha, if you will 
or catch. There's one thing that subclasses don't get from the superclasses. They don't get their constructors, right. So you have to define the constructors. So if we're going to look at these, We'll come back to the unit test in a minute. Our order class still contains an array list of pizzas. Now, we talked about this at the very end of class on Wednesday of last week. Can we put stuffed crust pizzas in the order? Yes. And why can we do that? Because stuffed crust pizzas are still a pizza. So in other words, any method or anything where the superclass is required, we can put in a member of the subclass. Now when we do that, what method will be used for pricing it? The method of the, if we, put, if we were to put a, a stuffed crust pizza in the order, what method would be used to price it? The pizzas calculate method or the subclasses calculate method? The subclasses, right. And that's known as polymorphism. In other words, I am over here, when I price the order, calling calculate cost. Well, depending on the kind of pizza that I have put in the order, it's either going to call the pizza's calculate cost method, or it's going to call The stuffed crust pizzas calculate cost method. So there's only one object out there. We can view that object either as a stuffed crust pizza or as just a plain old pizza. But either way, the proper methods get called because there's only one copy of that object on the stack. We can just point to it with either a pizza pointer or with a stuffed crust pizza pointer. All right? But there's still only one object there, and so we can call any of the methods that exist on a pizza, and we'll get the right version of them. All right, here we have the pizza class, which looks much as it did before. In the stuffed crust pizza, we only have the changes. We have the extra attribute that it has, which is a stuffing ingredient. We have a get and set method for that. And we have overridden the calculate bake time and calculate cost for the pizza. Notice we didn't have to declare the other attributes, the size, the crust, and it has pepperoni, because they were declared in the parent class. All right, they were declared in the super class, so we don't have to redeclare them. And we don't have to redeclare the get and set methods, because those methods work just fine for a, for a stuffed crust for the subclass and for a regular pizza the superclass. The constructors we have to recreate. Now there's going to be a shorthand we're going to see later on that, that streamlines constructor processing, but we're going to leave that go for now. All right. Um, we can actually call, we can actually explicitly call a function in the superclass from the subclass, but we're going to leave that go for now. All right. So as to not muddy the waters. The key word to say that something inherits from another class is extends. You know, and if you think about it, that makes sense just in a language sense. A stuffed crust pizza extends a pizza. It has everything a pizza has plus some extra stuff or plus some different ways of doing some things. 
All right? Now remember, and this is an important concept that at some point we'll, we'll get around to talking about the solution to. A subclass can only extend a single class. So there can only be one superclass per class. So if I had a class of things that include tomato sauce, for example, I could not have my stuffed crust pizza inherit from pizza and also from things that contain tomato sauce or round things, assuming it's a round pizza, all right, or any other, any other super class that you could dream up. Generally speaking, when you're deciding if there's a possibility of a class inheriting from more than one class, the consideration you make is what does it have most in common with? What attributes and what behaviors does it most have in common with? In other words, a stuffed crust pizza probably has more similarities to a pizza than it has other round things, right? Because round things include tires, hula hoops, basketballs, hockey pucks, and so on, right? So yeah, they may all have something in common, but a stuffed crust pizza has more in common with other pizzas than it has in common with other things that just happen to be round. All right. So sometimes that's called a strong is a relationship, as opposed to I guess a weak or a I guess you could say it is a <laughs> or something like that kind of relationship. All right. There's a diagram that you can use to create. There, there's a language for, for designing applications. It's called UML. All right? And UML has a bunch of documents that you can create. And we're not really interested in exploring all those documents, but there's two things out of UML that I think are good for us to consider as we're developing code. And one of them is called a class diagram. And one of them is called test cases. So. I posted some resources to Canvas, and let's take a look at the resources for class diagrams. And let's go, go back and retroactively create a class diagram for this example. Normally, it should happen the other way around, right? You should do the class diagram when you're planning it, and then go in and code what you have planned. But since we didn't take that approach in this class, um, we're going we're gonna to go back and retroactively do it. So, let's look under week seven, class diagrams. Again, I would rather just click here. Class diagram is a static diagram. What does static mean? doesn't change, and it doesn't really show like the flow of data. Some of you in other classes might have like used flow charts or, or um, uh, data flow diagrams that shows here's how an order gets processed. First this happens to an order, then this happens to an order, then this happens to an order. This really shows the different classes that we have in our application and the relationships between them. Probably the closest thing it might be um, that you may have dealt with, if you've had CISS 143, is the entity relationship diagram. It's sort of like an entity relationship diagram, except it is for classes and not for database entities. All right? But other than that, it's very similar. So it shows how the classes are related. Sometimes called a structural diagram. Model the static view. The classes are the only diagrams which can be mapped, blah, 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 blah. What's most important here is the example. And I'm going to try to make it a little bigger. This is a sample diagram where Notice 
this represents a superclass, and these two are the subclasses that relate to them. The arrow points from the subclass to the superclass. So this inherits from this. So this is a superclass. Remember I said the word generalization is sometimes used. These are generalized or special cases of the superclass. In other words, these are subclasses. Now, what you do in a in an object or in a class diagram is you indicate at least the main properties and methods. You can omit some less important ones if it makes your diagram look clear, more clear. All right. Um, I guess that's that's a judgment call sometimes. And the way I would typically do this is I would put the stuff that's in the main class, the attributes and methods, then I would put the stuff that's in the subclass and I would only put the stuff that's in the subclass. I wouldn't repeat the stuff that is in the superclass, which they seem to do in this example. And I think that's kind of redundant. They also repeat the methods. I would only repeat the methods if the methods are overridden in the subclass. It doesn't really make sense to me to repeat the methods if, if, they're, if they're not being overridden. For example, in this case, a special order has a dispatch method that doesn't exist in the order class. So I would show that. But confirm and close, unless those overrode the methods in the superclass, I wouldn't show them. The other thing that we have is we have a case of there's not inheritance here, right? This is a case of um, two classes interacting where there's not an inheritance. Um, it's not really composition either because a customer is not just a collection of orders. There's a lot of things about a customer. So this isn't like car with engine and brakes and all that. This is an order has some of these. Sometimes you'll even see that written on a class diagram. Customer places order. You actually see the word place there uh, to, 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 to indicate sort of the nature of the relationship. And what this shows is one customer can have n orders. But every order relates to one customer. All right? So in other words, a particular order, even if it's an order for the same thing, then it's a different order, right? If customer A and customer B both order 10 widgets, then it's a separate order, right? Because one goes to one customer, one goes to another. So if it's a relationship between those, generally a line is just drawn between, and you, you indicate like the, the, what sometimes is called the cardinality of the relationship. So let's go and retroactively create the class diagram for the pizza example. So let's go and do that. I'm not going to worry about the test class, all right? Because remember, the test class, the unit test class, is largely code that is not going to be in our final application. It is code that we are writing to make sure our business logic classes work. Later on, this will probably get hooked somewhere else, probably to a UI. So I'm going to ignore the unit test class in this example. So, classes are typically represented as rectangles. So we have our order, we have our pizza, and we have our stuffed crust pizza. So the relationship between pizza and stuffed crust pizza is that a stuffed crust pizza 
is a subclass of pizza. And that would be indicated with like an arrow drawn that way. An order, relationship between an order and pizza is that a given order can have many pizzas on it. So we don't know how many pizzas. We're certainly probably not going to turn down businesses and say, nope, you can order, only order five pizzas. If you want to order six, forget about it. So we represent that by one to n. And every order is, only goes to one pizza. It's not like we're going to take a pizza and deliver half of it to one house and deliver a half to another house or something like that. All right. We can even put, if it's helpful, something like a verb between the two that forms a sentence. An order contains pizzas. All right. In the top half, we indicate the attributes. And in the bottom half, we indicate the methods. So what's the attributes of our order? The attributes of our order, there is a, and I might be squeezing this in a little bit, there's a string that contains the name, there's a string that contains the phone, string that contains the address, and a boolean that contains if it's a delivery or not. The array list is sort of represented by this relationship between the two, so we don't have to put the relationship there. You might have a hard time reading that. I essentially just put these things up there, those four things. And the fact that there's an array list is represented by this line between the two. The attributes to a pizza, of a pizza rather, string for the size, string for the crust, string for has pepperoni, All right. In other words, these attributes that I have here. Right, boolean, not, not string. Thank you. A boolean for has pepperoni. And then the attributes for the stuffed crust pizza are simply, I think, what we awkwardly call the stuffing ingredient. Now, I'm pretty informal about this stuff, all right? Which means that, how do I want to put it? You know, different places have different policies and have different expectations of how you, did, how, how you do something. I'm not, it's not my desire to create a bunch of busy work for you, all right? Get and set methods are pretty straightforward. You're going to have a get and set method for every attribute. So I don't really see the need to put and enumerate every get and set method. Simply a line that says get and set methods for attributes are fine, or you can even omit that. Or you can even put a note on the bottom that says get and set methods for attributes not depicted. Now, whether that's official UML or not, probably isn't. But I'm more interested in the thought process that's involved than, than following the rules of some sort of diagram exactly. So, 
So, I would be more interested in the more important methods like the pizza has a calc bake time and so does the stuff crust and the pizza has a calc price and so does the stuff crust. You could also indicate the constructors there if it doesn't clutter it up too much. probably would be a good idea. Ideally you would want to show the signature of the function. In other words, what arguments the function takes and what gets returned. So for example, both calculate bake time and calculate price have no arguments and return doubles. That might be a little hard to read, but let me see if I can zoom in. That might be a little easier to read, or maybe not. We have an order that has a list of attributes. The pizza has a list of attributes and a list of the most important methods, and likewise with stuff crust. I forgot to go and put the methods for order those would include add pizza which accepts a pizza as an argument calc total cost which accepts nothing and returns a double and I think that's it So I don't show the stuff that is inherited unless it's overridden. And I'm om omitting the get and set methods just because, you know, uh, for clarity. But I can tell from this that there is inheritance here. And I can tell from this that this contains a list of pizzas. All right, so what then are test cases? Test cases are things that you want to test that make sure work. All right. And the test cases will come from the requirements of your application. So what are some of the requirements from this application? Well, we have orders that are both delivery and pickup. We have orders for different sizes of pizzas. We have orders for different kinds of crust. We have orders for pepperoni or not. We have orders for stuffed crust or not. So what might be some test cases that we would write to test to make sure this works? What are some things that we would want to test? Yes. Okay. We could come up with some combination. Somewhere in our test plan, we should test everything. All right. So we could do this a couple different ways. So one way we could do it, well, well we, could, we, could, we could actually document this and say test case one would be to order large, thin, pepperoni regular, large, 
than no pepperoni stuffed for delivery. And we could calculate the cost of what that should be. What should the cost of that be? Let's look. A large with a large thin with pepperoni would be thirteen dollars. A large thin with no pepperoni and stuffed crust would be fifteen dollars. Delivery is an extra two dollars. So this should cost out to be thirty dollars. So we come up with our test parameters. We come up, we should know the expected results. If you don't know the expected results, you got a problem, right? Because how can you test it? How can you verify that it's correct if you don't know how to manually price this, right? So therefore, you know, we could even talk to the manager of the pizza place and say, hey, if I order this, what would my cost be? And they'd say, well, $30. And if it's not $30, well, then you, there's something you didn't understand about the system. We could have the same order. with pickup. And that would be $28. And we could go down the line and we could create some test scenarios. We could create a, uh, an order with just one pizza. We could create an order with multiple pizzas. We could, could create where they mix pepperoni and not pepperoni, mix sizes. Come up with all that scenarios. Hopefully, Somewhere in that mix, we test all the different kinds of pizzas that you can make, right? And how many different kinds of pizzas that you can make? Well, that'd be small, medium, or large, pepperoni or not pepperoni, so that's six. Thin or thick crust, there's 12, all right? Plus, pick up and delivery, plus stuffed crust or a regular. To really test this thoroughly, it would take 96 test cases, if my math are off. Now you can bundle things in several test cases, right? You could, for example, you wouldn't have to t test each 96 pizzas individually. You could have one test case that tested a half dozen of them, and that would take six of them off the list, and so on. But the idea is, is that you plan what it's going to be, you test it and you compare your results with the expected results. And if your expected results are correct, then you did a good job. Now here's the good thing. If you go and change the system, let's say you add a different kind of option to it. All right? Um, giant extra large pizzas. All right? One problem that you have in software, especially software that wasn't really well designed, is you have what's called regression. You know, what, what does the word regression imply to you? Going backwards, right? So what does that mean in the sense of software? I mean, something that used to work stopped working, all right? So how do you prevent regression? You pull out these test cases and repeat them. So you add the code to test extra large pizzas, you do that fine. You go back and make sure you didn't break the calculation for large, small, medium, pepperoni, not pepperoni, blah, 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 blah. So you go back and retest those. So this test cases isn't something that you use and throw away. Ideally, you use it and build upon it as you make enhancements to make sure that any new stuff that you add to your system doesn't break any of the old stuff that was in the system. All right? Um, then you can have a checkbox that says, worked, didn't work. Stuff that didn't work, you go back and fix it. Fix whatever's wrong. Maybe for some reason there's a bug in there that delivery of stuffed crust pizzas, there's an error with. You go back and fix whatever that bug is. And then, do you just test that test case again? No you test all of them again, just to make sure you didn't break something. 
Now, the one thing I've heard more programmers say in my life than any other statement is, I don't need to test that because I didn't touch that code. All right? That is like one of the programmer's mantras. And almost as often, I've heard, I can't believe that that broke because I didn't touch that code. All right? It must have just broke in its sleep or something like that. Right? Especially poorly written software, the connections aren't obvious. It's like uh, the, the name that they typically give the poorly written software is spaghetti code, right? I don't know why, I love spaghetti, whereas poorly written software is something that you don't love. Why do they call it spaghetti code? Because if you pull a strand of spaghetti, you don't know something over here might move. That meatball way over here might topple down. Right? Or you might pull a strand way over there. Because things are not connected in an obvious sense. All right? Good software, I don't know what it would be like. Um, it would be like, like sushi, right? Or, or something like that. Whereas if you pick up one piece of sushi, you're not going to disturb the other pieces because they're all very distinct from each other. All right? OK, here's a resource that I prepared regarding, I didn't prepare it, I just linked to it regarding test cases. This, by the way, is only one kind of testing that you perform. All right, here's a list of some example test cases. And if you think that this is a pain, if you think that that's an awful lot of work, you're right. But it's something that you need to do to get good quality software. All right. So what's the problem I want us to consider in this class? We've had enough pizzas, and we've had enough students. So we're going to go to the library. So definitely before Wednesday, read through this and start thinking about sketching out a class diagram. I'm not sure how we'll go with it, if we'll work in groups or if we'll work in a, a big lecture. But try to sketch out a class diagram for this scenario. Under week seven. Library has a variety of materials. Books, new release books, DVDs, and new release DVDs. I actually forgot a piece of this. I will add this, I will add the piece in. I just thought of it right this minute. I did this late last night, so forgive me. All right, we'll, we'll go and we'll, we'll add the missing piece in. Now, what matters, the kind of thing it is, is how long you get it and what the late charge is. So, for example, a new release DVD you only get for three days and the fine is high. A regular DVD you get for seven days and the fine is low. All right, likewise with new release books. New release books you get for a shorter period of time. Um, regular books you get for a longer period of time. And the fine is correspondingly less or greater. So I will add that in, in here. But that's the two things that are different about, these, uh, about each of these. Patrons of the library have a name and email address. Every book has some ID number. 
the title of the book, the author, the date it was checked out, if it's currently checked out, and the patron that has it checked out, if it's currently checked out. All the DVDs have, this is what happens when you work late, your quality goes down a little bit. All DVDs have more or less the same um, information except DVDs have a rating, whether it's PG or R or whatever. All library material should be able to tell me, so all library material classes, so that's new DVDs, old DVDs, new books, old books, should be able to tell me what the due date is, whether or not it's overdue, who has it checked out, or if it's checked out, and finally, a fine based on the return date. When I say it should be able to return or should be able to tell, what, what are you thinking of? Is that an attribute or a method? It's going to be a method. All right. In other words, it should be able to calculate or should be able to determine all right, the date that it's due. That's not going to be an attribute, all right. but you know something about new DVDs and you know the date it was checked out, so you should be able to calculate the date that it's due. Patrons should be able to tell how many items a patron has checked out, if they have any overdue items, and how many overdue items. A patron should be able to check out an item. In other words, I should be able to say, I have a book object. I want to check it out. And that method should return a true or false. True if the book's checked out, false if the book isn't checked out. Well, why would a book not be able to be checked out? Well, if someone else already has it checked out. So if I try to check out a book and someone else has it checked out, shouldn't let me check it out. Shouldn't let me check it out if I have 10 or more items already checked out. So that's the limit this library has. You can only take 10 things out at a time. Or if I have more than three things overdue, it's not going to let me check it out. Strict library here. I should be able to check an item back in, and it should be able to tell me what the fine is. So if I check a book that was due two days ago, and the fine is a quarter a day, it should be able to tell me that the fine, I, okay, I'm checking in that book, and the fine to check it in is 50 cents. Design the classes to address the requirements defined above. Create a set of test cases to test your classes. The one thing I will do immediately once we get up in lab is I will put in the what the fine schedule is and how long you, you get to keep each of those things, because I forgot to do that. This might seem hard, but we're going to try to take a systematic approach to it. We're going to try to take a systematic approach of, first of all, deciding what our classes are going to be, all right, deciding how we're going to test those classes, and then we'll go and we'll worry about the functions and what the code needs to be in each function to get the job done. But that's not easy for people to do always. But envision the functions, what arguments they need to take and what they're going to return before you consider the details of what the function has to do. All right? So between now and Wednesday, it would be great if you could sketch out a test class diagram and we'll talk about this either in groups or as one big group on Wednesday. This seems a lot, but I aim to give you a lot of coaching on it. And I aim a lot of collaboration. So hopefully we'll be able to take a bigger problem like this and break it down into manageable sections.
All right. Questions? Yes. On the Yes. Yeah, the the stuff that the ingredient for stuffing, yeah. Uh string stuffed ingredient mozzarella. Yes. Why would you put that there and not the ingredient? It's just a different way to initialize it. I was being a little bit lazy on there. I didn't want to include that in the constructor at all. So I just I just wanted to copy the constructors over from the other one. Because we could have a fourth constructor that accepted the pepperoni, the the you know, whether it had pepperoni or not, the size, the crust, and what it's stuffed with. So yeah, we, we could have did that. That was just that was just a shortcut. I wasn't sure if it was is it necessary to have something there? No, it's just a different way to do it. You know, one way or another you probably should have some default set for things that are defaultable. All right, things that are required and are defaultable. Uh, they could be an argument you pass to the constructor, you could default them. All right, other questions? All right, see you up in lab.